Hey, I'm asking for extra coffee here to come down because I am fired up. It is Tuesday. I hope everybody had a great, great, great Memorial Day weekend. Hope everybody took time to just take a moment and think about those that gave, as everybody says, the ultimate sacrifice, that type of thing. Uh, And it's not that type of thing, actually. And when I say ultimate sacrifice, I mean sometimes we have in this country forgotten what the hell we're all about. See, we've gotten fat. Not only fat, but fat-headed. We think everything can just go along. We want to dishonor uh, traditions that have helped shape this country. Uh, And it's not good. It's not. I mean, we have the world's, the greatest country in the history of the world. I'm going to say that again. The greatest country in the history of the world. And we are jackassing around with it, and we got to stop. That's what I thought of on Memorial Day. How many people died for all of us to be free, for all the things we have, and now we look around this world and we're like, wow, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you mean we're actually better? Four, three, two years ago, we're actually better? It's got to stop, and we've got to figure this out, because we do have the greatest country with the greatest people. And man, we're fat-headed and being really stupid. All right, as we get into this, before I get into the show today, uh, I got to tell you, I love the fact that Jimbo Fisher... And Nick Saban are going to be in the same place. That's right. They're going to be in the same place. SEC spring meetings. Greg Sankey, the commissioner, says, yeah, we're beyond it. No, you're not. You're not ever beyond that as a coach. Take, I coached 25 years. The slights stay with you. They do. They stay with you. They, you, they never leave. You remember this forever, and you're angry. More importantly, in this fisher Saban thing, you're angry about it forever. I mean, you are blanked off till the end of your coaching career. And ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have more of this uh, as the week unfolds because these two guys are going to be in the room. There's nothing going to come out of this. But I'll tell you this, if I'm Jimbo Fisher, I'm not letting that go. I am not letting that go. I'll tell you right now, I would not let that go unless, of course, Saban was right, which he was. Now, I'm not saying Saban was right that Jimbo Fisher bought all of his recruits. I'm not saying that. I'm saying Saban was right when he said that everything's been in the paper that he said. He's not really telling you anything he didn't know. But they're together, spring meetings, everyone's there. I hope Trey Wallace is there. If Trey Wallace or any of our people are there, we'll have him on tomorrow. Can't wait. All right. I got to show you something. (laughs) We got an eggplant covering the junk of a statue um, that was unveiled yesterday or the other day in, oh, we didn't cover the junk. Ah, I thought we were. This is a statue. Some lady says, ah, a beautiful afternoon in summertime Oxford. Deeply honored to be asked to unveil Woman of Our Times, a moving graphic representation of modern femininity. My ass. Huge thanks, the Lib Dem Chairwell Council, for their love and financial support. Yeah, my ass. Let me tell you something. These aren't the women of our time. They're not. No, they're not. This is like 0.002%. You don't get to just all of a sudden say you're a woman. Women go through things that are unimaginable to men as they grow up with their own bodies. All of a sudden... You get to slap on some boobs, say I'm a woman? No, you don't. Not in my world. I think that's awful. I think this is so disrespectful to women. Modern femininity is CEOs, lead announcers, business executives, housewives, firemen, policemen, EMTs, construction workers, road workers, you name it, teachers like my daughter. That's modern femininity. That's the modern woman. The modern woman is not like, hey, I'm going to slap a uh, set of double Ds on me, walk around with some different hair, and tell people if you don't like what I'm doing, then you're a trans woman. I'm not a trans woman at all, but this isn't the modern woman. This is 0.000002%. 
The modern woman's a stud. The modern woman does it all. And to get to be a modern woman, they've had to overcome so many things in their young lives. I mean, we all have stories. You know, men used to laugh about, oh, man, so-and-so had her first period, blah, 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 on the on the on the rag that guy you know what women have had to deal so much and women are moving forward and now you set them back by saying this is a women of our times statue that represents modern femininity my ass it does it absolutely does not not in the real world see i live in the real world i live where people are actually people this isn't hollywood crap this isn't some kind of oh my god look how cool we are crap no this isn't i live in the real world and as I walk around the real world, I see women doing all kinds of things, getting ready to go teach school, getting ready to go to their job, getting ready to take care of a house full of kids, getting ready to you name it, and they're going to get it done, all while looking beautiful, all while taking care of others, all while doing things that men could never, ever, ever do. Look, man, let's be honest, man. We get, I don't know, squeamish if we stub our toe. I yell like a freaking baby. Guess what? My wife gave birth. I'm just telling you right now, this is disgusting for women. I don't care if you have statues like this. Great. Give whatever statue makes you feel good. But don't tell me this is modern feminism. Don't tell me this is the modern woman. This isn't the modern woman. This is make-believe. And it's crap. Speaking of crap, you know what's crap? The New York Times came out and, oh man, they did a study of 300 and some, I don't know, school administrators, teachers. And you know what they said? Oh, guess what? Because of the shutdowns, because of the mask mandates, because of all that is going on with the pandemic and how it was handled, American children are, quote, emotionally and socially behind. You think? I mean, I don't know about you, but Clay Travis on OutKick has been saying this forever. I've been saying this forever on radio shows. And all we do is get laughed at because here's what you say, right? This is the answer to, well, if we save one kid, yes, I get that. We all get that. Next, you're going to tell us, well, you know what? American business has been hurt by the shutdowns. What else you got for us? World's greatest newspaper. Speaking of newspapers, how about my friends at the Indy Star? Indianapolis Star. The Indianapolis Star. In Indianapolis. Got the winner of the Indianapolis 500 wrong. Yeah, showed a picture of the winner of the Indianapolis 500. And it wasn't the right picture. And we're supposed to listen to these people. All of a sudden, I'm going to get to this in a second. I'm going to get to Erickson winning it. But I want to go back just real quick. Yeah, real quick to the emotionally scarred. All of a sudden, we're just now thinking about this. All of a sudden, we just now got this figured out. Anyone with half a brain that understands kids at all understands a couple of things. There are some kids that live and die to go to school. There are some kids that hate school. There are some kids, most, are in between. I personally, any day off would be great. But I also got to tell you, if I had to sit at this desk every day and listen to Miss Sweeney or whatever the hell, uh, and I had to wear a mask when I went to school, it would be unbelievably, number one, scary, and number two, emotionally disturbing, and now we're just figuring it out. It is incredible how stupid we are in this country, how stupid we have been, all because, all because we want to look like we're doing something. It'd drive you nuts. It really will. I mean, if you let it, if you let it do what it, it'll drive you nuts. So, okay, yay, Ra. Good for you. The New York Times got it figured out. All right. That's something that literally every breathing 
thinking, that human being that pays attention. I'm not talking about dudes that are into their own thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about everybody that pays attention will tell you we knew this was coming. And it is a long road back. I wrote an article about kids are scared, man. Relax, parents. Try to help them out. Instead of scaring them more. It's called Munchausen by proxy is one of the things. I mean, honest to God. Think about what I've just talked about in the opening three minutes or ten minutes. Two coaches, grown-ass men making $9 million a piece, yelling and screaming on social media and TV. Fine. That's inconsequential. That don't even matter. We consider modern femininity to be a three-armed woman, or I don't know, man, because he's got a crank, with boobs. That means that you're a woman because you slap a couple double Ds on you, and all of a sudden here, the New York Times, the New York Times says, oh, by the way, uh, American kids are emotionally behind, socially behind, really? My God, who didn't, oh, really? Golly, I'm stunned by this development. You know, it's amazing how people that actually can think, like Clay Travis, that's how I started. Clay Travis can think. Like, he thinks for himself. And you just get crushed, and then all of a sudden, months later, it comes out like, well, you're right. That's the story of my life. I'll say things, and people will crush me, and they'll go, oh, you're a jackass, dog, and you suck. And I'll go, wait a second. Just wait for it. It'll come. Modern femininity is not a statue with a, a, uh, you know, a penis and a set of boobs slapped on and saying that's modern femininity. Modern femininity is Lee Ross up there going to work, teaching kids, working her brains, coming home, cooking, dinner, whatever. Same thing with my daughter, getting up every day, teach fourth grade, then going home, doing uh, paper, we're doing whatever. It, it, it drives me nuts. Hey, modern femininity, let's slap a couple double Ds with the person that has a penis, and that's what we got. No, it's not. Just stop it. And it's time people like us, all of us, whether it's, I, I don't know, stood up and said, great, do your thing, but don't force it down our throat, and don't try to dictate to us what is the modern world. Anyway, drive you nuts. Marcus Erickson did win the 500. Marcus Erickson did finish first in a race that this is the most important thing at the 500. What I liked about the 500 was that the 500 happened in front of about 350,000 fans. Now, I want you to think about that again. I want you to think about that real quick. 350,000 fans. And if you know anything about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway track, It's in the middle of a neighborhood. I'm being honest with you. This right here is modern femininity. Right here. Not some freaking bald-ass woman with a crank that you put some double Ds on. Would you agree? Yes. I'm a real woman. Real woman. That's right. Damn right. You're a hater. Whatever. Whatever. All right. So 350,000 people. 350,000. And like, all right, you ever been to Fenway? Have you ever been to Wrigley? Well, one time, true story, I don't know which way we came into Fenway, where the friend of mine parked first time I was ever there. I'm like, hey, man, where's Fenway? True story. And he goes, Dan, it's, 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 you're touching it. Oh, really? All right. It's the middle of the neighborhood. So is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway right on 16th and Georgetown. Speedway, Indiana. Now, there's a big parking lot across the street. You go out to the Coke lot, all that kind of stuff. But it's in the neighborhood. When you drive to the Indianapolis 500, you know what you do? If you want to park in someone's grass, you park in someone's grass. They're out there. They'll charge you. They'll make sure your car gets out. But that's big business in and around the Indianapolis 500. It's very cool. It's very cool. And hopefully some of you had a chance to go to it. And if you did, you saw, I think, the greatest pre-game ever. Most people pre-game by going to the bar. They sit outside, pull down their, their, their whatever, pull out their spread and drink and eat and have a great time. No, 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 no. At the Indianapolis 500, pre-game is being inside and watching all of the stuff going on. And it's 
freaking awesome. It's not kind of awesome. It is awesome. Now, Marcus Erickson, Erickson wins the thing. Scott Dixon got penalized. He had to move to the back of the, uh, back of the uh, what do you call it, back of the line, I guess. I don't know. Uh, my guy, Takuma Sato, he ended up getting a lap down. He was done. My other guy, Graham Rahal, never really competed. But it was a hell of a race. It was a perfect day, a little bit slick in two. We had some wrecks, some cautions. But look. All week long, people have been talking about Marcus Erickson. He's not being talked about. Marcus Erickson. I always said, well, we're talking about him. A uh, friend of mine, Kirk Cavan, who knows racing better than anybody in the city, he does shows on it. He's worked at the newspaper on it. Kirk told me, he goes, the person people are sleeping on is Marcus Erickson. Well, guess what? Marcus Erickson came through in the end. But even bigger than that, first time three years, we had back to normal the Indianapolis 500. Did you know? that at the Indianapolis 500, you can bring in coolers. That's right. Yeah, coolers. You bring them in. They measure them, but you bring them in, man. You want to bring every, every beer that's ever known to man, as long as it fits, you can bring it in. It's a good time. It's a really good time. I suggest you put it on your bucket list. In fact, I think I suggested that last week. All right. Uh, this is a serious problem. It's so ridiculous. It's just the way the world is. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul, gets him a DUI. All right. Got a DUI in Napa. Now you got to understand the Pelosi's are richer than rich, right? I mean, they got a hundred. Uh, Paul made a hundred million dollars, some venture capitalist in San Francisco and Nancy Pelosi. Come on. I mean, we all know she's been in politics forever and somehow, some way she's made millions and millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> so this guy, uh, Paul Pelosi, decides he's going to drive home drunk. I haven't seen exactly what his alcohol level is, but he thought he was going to get home, right? Whatever he thought. He thought that he was going to be okay to get home. Like, oh, I don't know, 99.9% .9 of people that drive drunk think they're going to get home okay, right? But here's what happens. You may think you're going to get home okay. But boom, a Jeep is trying to cross Route 29 in Napa. You get hit. Now you got to hang in there, right? You got to sit around there. You got to stand around there. You got to look around. You got to go, oh, man. And you know you're at least a little bit impaired. So it's not only you, people. It's not only you when you decide to drive drunk. It's not only you. It is also those around you. You don't know what Slappy Johnny's doing driving his Jeep. He may be hammered and hit you. I saw something where it says, you know, if, um, if he was going to San Francisco and he took an Uber XL, it would have cost him about $110. If he had taken the most expensive Uber, it would have cost him about $330. Now, minimum $10,000 fine. Look, I understand it's a drop in the bucket. I understand we'll see the requisite nonsensical uh, halfway or half-ass contrite type of deal. I understand we'll see all that. I do. And that's fine. I mean, I got no, you know, hey, guy made a mistake. Could have been a lot worse, right? So you live and you learn. But I just think it's always fascinating. I, I, I just think it's always fascinating when people that like Nancy Pelosi, and it could be anybody, try to tell us how we're supposed to live our lives and the world can't see the hypocrisy of her $10,000 refrigerator, gourmet ice cream, uh, richer than hell, and she's trying to tell all of us how we're supposed to live. There is a little bit of jealousy, I suppose, by all of us, and, and I suppose there is, this is not biblical, and I'm trying to be biblical, but I'm not being biblical here today. Uh, I suppose there is a little bit of, hey, you know what? I'm tired of hearing you all tell us how we're supposed to live when you can't even live right. If that makes any sense, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it does. I don't know if it doesn't. And I feel bad even talking about it. But somehow, some way, I just had to. I don't know. Bad person. Uh, Jeff Gladney dies, 25-year-old former NFL player, uh, dies in a car crash. And I got to tell you, um, I guess I could talk about every person that dies in a car crash, but it just kind of hit me. You know, it just kind of hit me at 25 years old, right? 25 years old, you die in a car crash. You know, I got a 25-year-old. 
I got a 25 year old, you got a 28 year old, and I don't like either of them. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, no, not that I don't like either of them. I'm sorry. I was distracted right there. Uh, I worry about both of them. Yeah, I don't like either of them. They were just in my, <laughs> my daughter's upstairs. <laughs> I don't like either of my kids. See, I got distracted. I was watching that Lamar Jackson uh, sending out a tweet under in third person. Lamar is going to be Lamar, Chris. But anyway, uh, I, I, I worry about things like that. I do. I worry about things like that all the time. 25 years old, you're supposed to be invincible. My daughter is 25. She's a school teacher. I've talk, I talk about her all the time because I'm very proud of her. But I worry like hell about her. I'm not going to lie to you. I worry like crazy about her. And anytime I see somebody uh, her age pass away, I worry even more. Um, also, anytime I see somebody my age pass away, I worry about that too. Like, oh man, I'm no longer a spring chicken, but it just hits me. It's sometimes certain things hits me. I guess, you know, if I weren't a hypocrite, I don't know. Maybe I'm talking about uh, this young man because he's a football player and he's popular. But I saw it, man, 25 years old. I'm like, God dang it. Today's my sister's birthday. Happy birthday to my sister. I'm not going to tell you how old she is, but it's her birthday. Uh, Anyway. Celtics Warriors coming up. Let me go through the Celtics getting there. Is this the oddest series ever? Like the Celtics get beat at home. Now they got to go to the heat. And guess what? Everybody that I looked at was betting on the freaking Celtics to go into the heat and win. And they did. Here's what you got with the Celtics. All right. This is what you have with the Celtics that the Mavericks didn't have. And I'm going to talk to Tim Doyle coming up at 10 o'clock about this very thing. All right. I said this before. I'll say this again. To beat the Warriors four times out of seven in two weeks, you got to have great players, Hall of Fame type players. The Mavericks had one, Luka. That was it. They could not beat a team that's got two for sure, probably a third, And I don't know where Andrew Wiggins is going to end up, but he's not going to end up in the Hall of Fame, I don't think, but he could. So anyway, let's look at the Celtics. Uh, Jason Tatum. There's talk now that, well, if Jason Tatum wins a title, is he a superstar? Stop it. Jason Tatum is a superstar. As the Celtics president or, or general manager, Brad Stevens, told me one time, he said, hey, Dan, there's only about 20 superstars in the league and the rest are role players. Well, Jason Tatum's a damn superstar. I mean, make no bones about it. Absolute superstar. He doesn't need these guys on on ESPN's approval. He doesn't need any of that. Dude's a superstar. I'm not so sure Marcus Smart isn't either. Let's compare Marcus Smart as the defensive player of the year in the league to anybody that was on the Mavericks. Now, you're going to tell me Brunson, Jalen Brunson's really good, and I'm going to say you're right. But he hasn't won any kind of award across the entire NBA. I don't maybe most improved, but I don't think he did. Uh, then you got Jalen Brown. Those three guys are better than any combined three guys that you could piece together on any team, maybe outside of the Warriors. I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, you can give me Kyrie and, and Durant, but that was a mess. I can only go by this year. So as I look at this, I say to myself, wait a second, hold on, time out. This is the matchup that I was talking about, and I didn't even know it. I was talking about you got to have great players. You got to have a bunch of great players. Think back to the Bulls. People say Michael Jordan's the greatest player ever, and I think he is. He and Kareem, at least in my lifetime. But I got to tell you, Michael Jordan, the coach, the GM, Jerry Krause, were really smart. How are they smart, Dan? They kept adding really good, if not great, players to the mix. They didn't have Dennis Rodman when they won the first three. They did the last three. Tony Kukos didn't grow up here. He he didn't all of a sudden show up on the Bulls with a first-round draft choice. Bulls were smart. Went out and got him. Well, that's exactly what the Warriors are. And when I say exactly, I mean exactly. Bull, Warriors have Curry. Thompson, I don't care about the debate about top 75 players. They're top 10 players in the league right now. Draymond Green, the number one facilitator, four stars in the league. Now, I'll explain that to you if you'd like, 
but he covers up things offensively by making plays to, for others. He screens, he moves, he passes, he defers. And then on the other end, if you really watch him, that dude covers up everything. He's always in the right spot defensively. You can switch him to everybody. So what they do? They went out and got the first pick in the draft from years ago, Andrew Wiggins. You know what the Bulls did? They went out and got the first pick in the draft from years before, Bill Cartwright. You're the first pick in the draft if your name is not uh, what's-his-face and what's-his-face, Bennett or the other guy, Foltz. You could really play if you're number one pick in the draft, but if you're those two, not so much. Hell, why do you think they brought Bogan in? Remember, he was the first player picking the draft. It's not a hard thing to figure, but you got the two best teams in terms of the best three players. That's what you got. Now, I think it's going to be hard for either team to beat either team. We're going to get into it with Tim Doyle. We'll break it down even farther. But I think this is going to be one heck of a series. I think this is going to be terrific. And again, you can love one side, hate the other. I hope you do. That makes it more fun. But I love watching the Warriors play basketball. I love when the ball goes in the post. I watch opposite the ball, and there's dudes cutting and moving and screening and sliding. and mo- I mean, not just interchange. It's freaking awesome. It is. And once again, six of eight years, they're in the NBA Finals. Damn. That's a bit of a dynasty in my world. So what did we start the show with? All right? We started the show with two grown-ass men making 90 million a year going at it. We continued the show with one of the most ridiculous statues ever. And I don't care just because some, well, I'm really woke. And, and you know, it's an honor to put this statue out for modern feminism. <laughs> Modern this. What else we got here? Oh, yeah, all of a sudden the New York Times figures out kids are emotionally and socially behind given what we did to them. I'm proud to say I didn't do nothing to any kids. I didn't do nothing. I didn't demand anybody wear a mask where they did. I didn't do a damn thing. You people making the decisions, you screwed up our kids. Now, I don't know what you do about it. But we all told you. We all told you. Marcus Erickson wins the Indy 500. Great story. Better story. Marcus Erickson wins the Indy 500 in front of 350,000 people. The 500 is back, baby. Pelosi's husband gets a DUI. Jackass. Uh, Jeff Gladney dies. It, it just it gets. I hate when kids get hurt. And now that I'm getting older, 25-year-olds are kids. Could, I've told you this before. I could not watch The Wizard of Oz. Why? Because I can't see kids getting hit, hurt. Little girl, I wrote about this in an OutKick article. Little girl behind my house stabbed 33 times by our neighborhood crazy guy. I hate it. And then, of course, Boston beats Miami. Golden State, Boston in the final. So we're off to a good start this abbreviated week. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I got a lot to say to you people. I do. I got my top five all-time point guards. I got my top five all-time centers in my lifetime. I don't know about George Mikan. Hell, I didn't even put Wilt in there. If I saw you play, and I remember seeing you play, I remember Will a little bit, but if you were playing when I was rocking and rolling, that's my lifetime. We're going to come right back. See, let me, let me tell you one last thing. One last thing, and then I will let you go to a break. Um, Did you know this? Let me just just help y'all out here. Those of you that are so into uh, numbers, listen to this. I have my mug here, Chicago, right? 48 people shot in Chicago, eight dead over the weekend. Chicago. 48 shot. I can give you numbers of Indy. It ain't quite that, but it's damn close. 48 shot in Chicago over the weekend. We'll be right back.
And I'm a bit hypocritical here, okay? Because one point I'll say Isaiah is the greatest point guard in the history of the world, but let's get into it. Top five point guards ever. Now, there's a lot of debate here, right? There are a lot of guys. Chris Paul's got to be on there. I've never been a Chris Paul fan. I, I like him. I had a chance to interview him. I thought he was a really good dude. But look, when your last name, and this is everybody has their own biases, okay? Let's start with that. But when your name ends in I-C-H, my name, Dockage. P- P- Pistol Pete's name, Maravich. You got to put Pistol Pete up there in your top five point guards. Led the NBA in scoring, led the NBA in assists. You know what people do with, you know what people did with Pistol Pete? People bought jerseys before buying jerseys was cool. People decided, hey, man, what day is Pete Maravich coming to our city? That's right. That's right. What, when, where, what, how? Now, look, back when Pete played at LSU, the college basketball game wasn't nearly what it is today. You know this. Every single day on your television, you could watch a college basketball game. Pete Maravich in three years has the college basketball scoring record, and it ain't even close. He did not have a three-point line. People said he had an average 50. I'm not going to bore you with all the statistics, okay? But Pete Maravich, according to not only fan and fanboys like me, I can admit when I'm a fanboy. Are you kidding me? I know exactly what I am when it comes to Pete Maravich. Pete Maravich was must-see TV when we didn't have must-see TV, particularly with the NBA. And he had a style, he had a class, and frankly, if you paid attention to Pete Maravich, you understood he was a guy that brought a basketball into the movie theater when he went on a date. Dribbled the basketball outside the window in his car. The greatest teaching ball handling videos in the history of the world are Pete Maravich ball handling videos. If you want to see something that is unbelievable, it is Pete Maravich's ball handling videos. Not one human being alive today could do the things with a ball that Pete Maravich could do or would try, I guess, to do them in a game like Pete Maravich would do. That's right. Yeah, I know there's probably, if you go numbers-wise, Chris Paul's probably better, but he ain't better than Pete Maravich. Not in my world, people. No, I won't have it. i tell you who else I won't have. Nobody, you guys don't even know Tiny Archibald. Don't at me, people. Tiny Archibald, I guess until this year, I guess Trey Young did it. He led the league in total number of points and total number of assists. You know, there's a difference, average and all that stuff, and you guys get so analytical. But in my world, Tiny Archibald leading the NBA with the Kansas City Royals in freaking assists and points is the precursor to the modern point guard. Think about the modern point guard. The modern point guard dribbles the basketball until the ball actually bleeds. You see blood coming out of a basketball. If you were paid by the dribble, if you went to a game and you said, you know what, you're going to get a dime for every time that point guard dribbles, you would walk out of there a very wealthy man. Well, Tiny Archibald did that. Tiny Archibald was left-handed. Every single day, I would look and see what Tiny Archibald scored. I didn't even like his teams, he ended up on the late, on the Celtics, was really good. He and Maravich both, actually, and another guy, Bill Walton, ended up on the Celtics and, you know what, won championships, that kind of thing. But when he was in his heyday, I believe Tiny Archibald to be literally the most unstoppable player, non-big man in the league. Now, you got to remember, the league was different. Big men got the ball. You had sky hooks, so big men were the focus. But in terms of guards... He, Tiny Archibald, was the most unstoppable force. I'll never forget when Tiny Archibald was on, and he wasn't on all that much, but when he was on, I watched. And what's that guy's name, J.J. Redick? J.J. Redick can talk about playing against plumbers and whatever else. That's fine. You think that. But Tiny Archibald played against dudes that would take your head off. And he was tiny was his nickname, which means he wasn't that big. Tiny Archibald's damn good. Steph Curry, number three. Like, don't argue with me about whether he's a point guard or not. Don't even, don't, do not at me about it. 
You want to make Steph Curry a two guard? Good for you. You want to make Steph Curry a point guard? That's me. You want to say Draymond Green's a point guard? Good for you. I don't care how you put him. But in my world, Steph Curry's third best point guard ever to play the basketball game. 26 6 and 6 in finals. He takes his teams to the finals every year. Idiots on TV right now. What would another title in finals MVP do for his legacy? He's one of five players all time to average 25 5 and 5. LeBron. Bryant, Jordan, and West. Okay, great. What would it do for his legacy? It wouldn't do anything. He's already one of the whatever player in the world you want. If he wins it this year, good for him. I mean, I guess because we count things. Like we say, all right, like this guy's averaging 32, 8, and 6. Yeah, but he can't play dead. He can score. To me, Steph Curry is an all-time great. To me, If Steph Curry wins the title this year, he could average four, he could average 40. I don't think it matters. He's still an all-time great. I'll let other people decide whether he's a top 10, a top 5, but in my ranking of point guard, he is behind two. Now, you're going to say, because I don't have Oscar Robertson, I don't have Jerry West, I don't because I didn't see him play. I saw Oscar when he was heavy. Uh, he was with Lucius Allen, Bobby Dandridge, and, of course, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou Cinder at the time, won an NBA championship, but he wasn't the focal point. I remember Oscar. I remember Wilt, and I remember uh, Jerry West. If I did, probably have him on. But nobody, and I mean nobody, is going to tell me that Steph Curry isn't just behind these next two guys in the history of basketball as a point guard. And these next two guys, I could flip them anytime you want. I could make one, one, and one the other. Isaiah Thomas, I'm going to say this, is the best little point guard ever to play the game. Yeah, I don't care. I mean, you could tell me, hey, look, Isaiah Thomas did this. Isaiah Thomas did that. And you know what I would say? You're right. Isaiah Thomas is probably the toughest point guard to ever play the game. Isaiah Thomas is one of those guys that when he goes on the court – Everybody go, whoa. Hey, Zeke. He's a killer. Not kind of a killer. A stone cold killer. When I say killer, I mean the kind of guy that will smile at you, rip your absolute head up. I mean rip your freaking heart out. I mean take your brain out your ear. Isaiah Thomas, 28 points, third quarter on one leg. Never whined, never bitched, never moaned. Somehow he got sideways with all the, uh, you know, as he calls them, the fun trio. Bird, uh, Magic, and Jordan. He got sideways with them. But, but did you know this? I want you to listen to this clearly. Did you know this? Did you know that Magic's, or excuse me, did you know that Isaiah's crew is the only crew the only one to go through Bird, Jordan, Magic. I want you to think about that again. Bird, Jordan, Magic. Isaiah's team went through those three and won a title. Don't tell me that dude isn't an American badass. That dude may be the American badass. And the fact that all those guys didn't like him, I totally understand that. Look, how do I put this right? Um, my wife always says, man, I thought you'd have had more friends. Yeah. South side of Chicago, I'm not from where he's from. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, hell, I, you know, no. He, he's from one of the toughest neighborhoods uh, in the world. I mean, he really is. And if, if you don't understand that, then I can't help you. But he is. But I, under, I understand the, what's the right way to put it? I understand the mindset. We don't get along with people great. Don't. Nice. I'm going to give you something else. So I understand him getting sideways with a bunch of guys that maybe he thinks are phony. I don't know. In the 1984 playoffs, listen to this. Isaiah Thomas put up 16 points in 94 seconds to force overtime. Isaiah ended the game 35-12-3, two steals. I'm telling you, Isaiah Thomas did things nobody did. And one of them 
is when Bird, Jordan, match it. Come on. So I'm going one and one A. Isaiah Thomas, best little point guard. Best point guard that I ever saw was Magic Johnson. Now, some of you want to argue this. Some of you want to say, well, Bob Cousy. I see Bob Cousy. I'm talking about in my lifetime. When I saw Magic play Bird, actually, when I saw Magic for the first time, Michigan State, he was playing in a zone. And I'm like, man, that's a badass zone. They had a bunch of dudes that could really get in the zone. Long arm guys. And then I saw him handle the ball. So you know what we all did? We all went outside and did what Magic did. Then I saw him play Bird in a championship. And you got to understand, where I'm from in Indiana is about four hours north of where Indiana State is. Everybody that I know that went to Indiana State at that time, they went there because they couldn't get in anywhere else. Sorry, but it's true. I don't think it's true now or is it? I don't know. But anyway, so I'm watching Magic play Bird. I'm like, this ain't even close. Magic Johnson's five times the player that Larry Bird is. And then, wait a second, I had to slow it down as I watched him. But if you watched Winning Time, the Lakers movie, I got to tell you, man, that championship game in 1980, when, and for us, I've told you this before, it was on tape delay. I watched it over at Diane Laverty's house. She was my girlfriend at Cedar Lake. I got a gun pulled down my, uh, put to my head later on that night. I could tell that story at a different time. So I go from watching the NBA Finals to hustling to try to make it home by my mom's kind of curfew, my dad's kind of curfew. I go around a cop. Uh, I didn't know it was a cop. He didn't have anything. He told me to pull over. I told him no. He showed me a badge this way. And next thing you know, I got a gun to my head. Actually, it was a gun to this head. I'm like, oh, man, this ain't good. It was a dark road. Could have killed me. I smelled booze, too. I remember that night, as would you. But anyway, so as magic went on and on and on and on and on and on and on, there was no better point guard. If you were going to draft... Who you want on your team during that era, Magic Johnson would probably be the number one pick. In fact, I would say he would. You take all those guys. You take Magic Johnson in his prime, Michael Jordan, Isaiah Todd, you take them all. Kareem, I bet you Magic Johnson would be the number one pick. Now, everybody's in love with Michael Jordan because of the video and all that stuff. But I'm telling you, I bet you, I bet you, a lot of people, most people would take uh, Magic Johnson if you're starting a team. I, I would. I would. Jordan be hard to pass. And Jordan, uh, you know, he would have that chip on your shoulder and all that stuff that everybody waxes philosophic on. And he might. But I'll tell you this. I'd take Jordan or Magic, one of the two. It's that simple. Uh, best centers of all time. Now, this sounds like a dumb conversation in the modern world, right? I mean, let's work with me here. So you got centers. Now, does anybody really care about a center? I'm going to go through both teams with Tim Doyle coming up. Let me ask you a question. Celtics, center, back to the basket, throw it down there. Who? Horford, I guess. I don't know. Robert Williams hangs around the bucket. Warriors, center, post-up option. Draymond, point forward, is that what we call it? I mean, I look around, he's t- there's no center. Uh, back in the day, there used to be a center. Back in the day, there were really good centers. In fact, I don't know whether the game is good or bad. Better or worse for it. But I know this, man. Everybody had a center. I'm going to tell you my number five. My number five is Bill Walton. Like, look, if you're my age, here's what you saw, okay? Just bear with me a second. You saw Bill Walton in college go 21 for 22 in a national championship game. I'm going to say that again. 21 For 22 against Kentucky, I believe it was, in the national championship game. Maybe it wasn't Kentucky, I don't know. But anyway, think about that for just a sec. 21 of 22. That's what we saw. And then Walton came out, and he became this mountain man, right? All of a sudden, he went from this guy... You know, red hair, looked like any other college student, 
to all of a sudden he goes to Portland and he's a mountain man, long hair, and there was always talking about what diet's he on. He's a vegan, but a little bit 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 So he goes through and he struggles for a little bit. Then it happens. Then Bill Walton decides, all right, I'm gonna get, and this is unfair. I'm gonna get serious about my my NBA career. But in the in the middle of it, Bill Walton decides. However, he decides. All right, I don't know how he decides. All right, I, I don't. But he decides he's gonna get involved with the what is it called? Symbian Lebanese Army. Somehow, I don't know. He's involved with Patty Hearst. If you're my age, you remember Patty Hearst got kidnapped. Next thing you know, she's holding a gun in a bank robbery. The whole thing was chaos and madness, okay? It was insanity. But, but, that's what you did. That's what he did. So then in 1977, Bill Walton decides, all right, my career is important enough. I'm going to get with Maurice Lucas, uh, Lionel Hollins, Dave Twardzik, Steele, the rest of these guys, Johnny Davis, and we're going to get pretty good. So what does Bill Walton decide to do? He decides that he's going to become the best player in the NBA. He does. He wins the 1977 Most Valuable Player Award, wins the Finals Award, and his team wins a championship. He's a little, for me, like what Pete Maravich is. Because Bill Walton used to run down the court like this over his head. And so what did we do? Like, I was six foot three, I guess. I don't know, two then. I wasn't very big, but, you know, I told me the ball. I thought I was Bill Walton, his best passing big guy. If you influence me in a way that makes me go out to play basketball, then we're in business. All right? Let's see here. 1978, most valuable player, NBA championship, finals MVP. I said 77. He had all, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, after being selected, Walton led the Blazers to an NBA championship in 77 and 78. He was great. Like, I don't think they had another Hall of Famer on his team. Lionel Hollins was good. Maurice Lucas was the enforcer. He was terrific. He was absolutely terrific. Uh, played a couple years, six man of the year in 85, 86. But Walton's top five center in my world, I think. I don't know. Now he's a wacky commentator that I can't get through a game listening to, and I wish I could. I do, because he does more research on players and history, but I, 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 I can't do it. I mean, he was kind of an idol of mine. I can tell you what high school he went to, Helix High School, and I'm not looking at my notes. I'm looking at my notes for something else, but it ain't Bill Walton where he went to high school. I can tell you right now. Shaquille O'Neal, number four. Now, Shaq wears me out. Shaq acts like he was this hardworking – Look at Shaq's history, man. He's big, couldn't do nothing. We played against him. I was coaching at Indiana. He made 12 or 12 free throws. Believe that. Look it up. It's an NCAA record. People don't believe that. He did. Shaq got by him being big and overpowering people, and here's where I respect it. I respect it because Shaq knew who he was, what he was, and did it. He wanted to physically dominate you, and he did. And I respect that. Shaq didn't really have a game. He could jump hook it a little bit. Shaq didn't have this incredible work ethic that he wants you to believe. She was fine. I was around Shaq once. I thought he was a great dude. We were filming Blue Chips. It was in Frankfort, Indiana. And he was great. Shaq was awesome. It's good to everyone. I always liked Shaq. He's wearing me out now by acting like he was this workaholic thing or how great he was. But, hey, look, he was smart enough. He had some dudes around him, and that's what you got to have as a big guy. But Shaq certainly was a dominant player. The one thing I always thought overshadowed Shaq was the supposed feud with Kobe Bryant. You know, the truth of the matter is uh, Shaq was great. Kobe was great. What's the problem? You're in L.A., you're both doing whatever you want, you're both acting great, acting bad, whatever. You own the town. You own the country. People loved you. But if you threw the ball to Shaq, one thing you knew, he was not going to shoot a fadeaway jump shot. And I was always taught in basketball, never shoot a fadeaway jump shot. Go on the block, whoop somebody, and let's go. And Shaq did, and I liked it. I don't think he's better than these other guys. You're not better than Moses Malone. 
Moses Malone, number three. Moses Malone, again, he said something that influenced my life. When I was in high school, I was a forward. And whatever. Moses Malone said, I go after every offensive rebound, hoping to get two, maybe three a game. Now think about that. And he did. Like Moses Malone did. Moses Malone came out of high school. There's a great story about Moses Malone. His mother literally put a pen in a sleeping Moses Malone's hand and signed his name to scholarship papers for Lefty Drizel and the folks at Maryland. Now, you got to understand, the apartment complex that Moses lived in, next door, Tate's Lock and the boys at Sarah, or Clemson had moved into the apartment next door. That was recruiting back in the day, baby. But anyway, Moses... He goes to the NBA, ABA first. All of a sudden, he's a skinny kid. All of a sudden, he ain't no skinny kid no more. All of a sudden, Moses Malone is doing things on a basketball court offensive rebounding-wise that, I'm being literal here, made some of the toughest guys in the NBA shudder. Moses Malone made really tough dudes cringe. He was relentless. He was tough. And you know what? As best I could tell, as he got older, maybe not younger, he was every night. A friend of mine that played uh, with me at Indiana, Winston Morgan, named his son Moses. I, I haven't talked to Winston about it, but I assume it's after Moses Malone. Damn, that was a bad man. And if you remember our show, he saved Barkley's career. He told Barkley, you're fat. He said, yeah, you're fat. Barkley told the story on our show. You got to get in shape. You can't play basketball fat. Moses Malone was great. Number two, Hakeem Olajuwon. Look, Hakeem Olajuwon as a center had more moves than anybody not named Kevin McHale. And I could have put Kevin McHale on there, but I felt like Paris was the center. But when you win championships, now I understand. I understand it's in the Michael Jordan retirement era. I understand that. But when I watched Hakeem Olajuwon, I always tried to watch centers as I got older based on how you would guard them. How would we how would we play them? What would we do? I'm not sure I know how to handle Akeem Olajuwon. Because Akeem Olajuwon could face up on you. Akeem Olajuwon had a quick step. Akeem Olajuwon could get up in the air over you. Akeem Olajuwon obviously had the dream shake. Akeem Olajuwon had some Moses in him too where he'd go to the offensive rebound like crazy person. Akeem Olajuwon I think is very underrated. When people talk about different folks in basketball. I think Moses Malone and Akeem Olajuwon are two of the most underrated people in basketball. They influence the game. The dream shake, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. But that wasn't the whole game, man. He ran the floor. He guarded. He was undersized for some of these guys that he played. But this dude was a badass. And he was a badass his entire career. Akeem Olajuwon, if you go back and look at Akeem Olajuwon, we all talk about Kevin McHale's great footwork. When you talk basketball, Kevin McHale, greatest footwork ever. Akeem Olajuwon, probably better. He right there. Led his team to championships. Uh, Best center in my lifetime, and I would argue the best center ever, uh, except by the numbers. Because you could argue that Wilt, by the numbers, insane. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, to me, is the most underappreciated, greatest ever in any sport. I'm going to say that again and I'll say it right. You can make the argument that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the greatest player ever in the NBA. All right? You can. I mean, look at the numbers, fine. But he's the least appreciated. Now, you can make all of the excuses about it. Well, you know, he, he changed his name. People didn't like that. You know, by the end, he stayed on too long. By the end of the day, you know, he's walking up. No, no, no. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is, was the most unstoppable force in the history of basketball. Now, you're going to say to me, Michael Jordan, I'm going to say to you, no. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played against, and he said it in the movie Airplane. He played against dudes every night. Thurman. Lanier, Reed, Unsell, I mean, Artis Gilmore, Clifford Ray. I mean, big, strong, mean dudes. Moses, he played against Will. I mean, stop me if you haven't heard a great player in here. 
people. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with the sky hook, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had a jump shot. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, if you look at some pictures, the rim is here, his hand is here. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would have been, unlike probably any of these guys, maybe, maybe with the exception of Bill Walton, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would have been a great player if he was six foot three. He would have. Most big guys aren't. Most big guys wouldn't be great players if they were six foot three. Shaq wouldn't even play basketball. If he was six foot three, he'd probably been a tight end. Walton would have been. He would have been. Hakeem, I don't know, probably a soccer player, right? He grew up to be a soccer player, then all of a sudden he had this growth spurt, and next thing you know, he's balling. Uh, but in my mind, in my mind, Kareem Abdul Jabbar is the first or second best player that I ever saw along with Michael Jordan. Hey, look, everybody's got their own thing, right? Everybody's got who they like. That's fine. That's who I like. That's my top five in each. Timmy Doyle's going to join us. I love Timmy Doyle. He's going to join us coming up here in a few, and we're going to talk about Celtics, Warriors, and then I have got such stupidity at 1030. Today in stupidity. You don't want to miss today in stupidity, people. Don't miss today in stupidity. And don't miss Timmy Doyle. I will guarantee you this. Between Timmy D and I, this will be the most energized segment you will see all week. We'll be right back with the great Tim Doyle next.
Every time we have Tim Doyle on to discuss NBA, NBA betting, the ratings spike, particularly from women. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, look at this hair. I mean, look, uh, I think it's a more mature haircut right now. This might be the best I've ever seen you look. I think it is. No, it is. Thank you. And I actually uh, drank all weekend. Craig Moore, my f- former teammate at Northwestern, he got married. So he plays on USA Basketball with r- the great Robbie Hummel from Purdue. And everyone, you know, when you go to a wedding, everyone goes around, they go, you know, how do you know Craig and stuff? And the reason Craig and I became good friends was, you know, first week at Northwestern, we were in the shower together. And I pulled them aside afterwards and I went, hey, buddy, we got to manscape a little bit. Like, you know, like this is going to get weird the next four years of college. I tried to help the guy, Dan, right away. So I pulled him aside. Like everyone has that conversation with like an older sibling or a cousin. Craig didn't have an older brother. So like I put him, we walked. I remember we were going up to the training table. I said, hey, I got to talk to you about something. Like it's going to get really weird the next four years. Here's some clippers. Get in there, okay? Like, go take care of yourself. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm trying to think if Randy Whitman would have had that conversation with me when I was a freshman. I'd have been like, no, what, what are you, that what was are you the talking 80s? about? That, that, was like, that was what you did in the 80s. You basically had Don King in a leg lock. Like, that was the look back then. <laughs> yes, it was. Proud display, <laughs> baby. Just a proud display. <laughs> hey, all right. Before, <laughs> before, man, I'm just. Hey, Doc, I gotta talk to you, man. You know, here, here, you gotta clean it up down there, buddy. You got no chance. I'm like, boom. <laughs> hey, uh, why were the Celtics able to beat the Heat? And what the hell was that series about, man? I that was a great series. Odd, very odd. You know. Game six was probably one of the more confusing games I've watched in a long time. Boston's at home. They're eight-point favorite. And they got run out the gym by the Miami Heat. You know, what Boston (laughs) has done throughout the playoffs, well, at least against Milwaukee and Miami, maybe not so much against Brooklyn, is like games they're supposed to win, they lose, and then they win games they're not supposed to win. But I think the big thing and the deciding factor for me, because I am making (laughs) – Where is my money bag? You see this right here? I carry this around my town, all right? I am pounding the Celtics here. I am taking all my money out. I am putting it all on Boston. Dan, this series should be a pick em. The fact that I'm getting plus 160 comeback uh, Warriors are minus 180. You don't know the odds. Boston has won two games on the road against Brooklyn, two games on the road against Milwaukee, and then obviously two games on the road, including game seven against the Miami Heat. Boston is battle-tested. Dan, who has the Warriors beaten? They beat Luka and Jokic with no help, and Memphis without John Morant? The Warriors are fugazi. (laughs) Fugazi. Hey, here's my problem betting against the Warriors, all right? The streaks, the runs that they go on, you can, if you bet the Celtics, I get it, right? I, I've said it. You got to have real dudes to beat the Warriors, Timmy. You, you can't, you can't show up, you know, with Spencer Dinwiddie. You got to show up. They have guys, the Celtics, but you can never be comfortable because the Warriors can go 21 to three on you damn near any moment, Tim. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think game one is going to be the swing game in this series. Well, maybe there's a little wiggle room for game two because I feel like Boston's going to win this in six, Dan. You know, you get to game seven and you're going to try to beat the Warriors on their home floor. That might be really tough to do. Um, am I am I frozen? I don't like that. Am I, am I freezing on you? No, there? no, no. I got you. No, I got okay. you. I got you. Freezing in my own computer. Um I think winning game seven at Golden State is going to be tough. Now, Warriors have been just straight chilling since, you know, they beat Dallas. And obviously that was an emotional series for Boston, you know, knocking off Miami. Game one against the Heat after they beat Milwaukee, they got beat up in that game. So, you know, if you want to bet the Warriors, I get it. They have not lost at home. But I think that they have gotten very fortunate as far as their draw in the Western Conference. They avoided the Suns. Ja got hurt. And they played Luka and Jokic, you know, know, guys that that didn't have much help around them. So I think the Celtics, look who they have beaten. 
They beat Giannis on their home floor in a closeout game. You beat Durant in series number one. And then it wasn't pretty, but you figure out a way to win game seven in Miami. I think the Celtics, their past performances are stronger. Do you, would you rather be playing like the Celtics are, or would you rather, as you said, be chilling like the Warriors are? I'd rather be playing because I think what Boston has done is they've learned how to win multiple ways. You know, some games it's, you know, Grant Williams took 17 threes in game seven against the Bucs. Like, I don't think they ever envisioned when they drafted Grant Williams a game in his career where he was going to shoot 17 three-pointers. Maybe that would, I mean, that's like insane. But they learned that they could win that way. Peyton Pritchard has played valuable minutes. You know, Al Horford has had monumental games. Like, I think Boston knows that they have multiple options. But, hey, I get it. You know, the, the experience factor with the Warriors, been there before, home court advantage, haven't lost in the postseason. I don't know. When I go to the track... And I go often. I like to look at past performances and what have you done as of late? And I've learned a lot about Boston in this postseason. I think they've learned how to win multiple ways. I think they've learned a lot about themselves. I think they've faced adversity and overcome it. Like they've done a lot. I just think this series should be more of like a jump ball. Instead, I'm getting plus 160 with Boston. Oh, I'll take all that. <laughs> hey, let me ask you. If if you were going to say right now, just taking this series, Clay Thompson and uh, Curry are Hall of Famers, all right? I've been talking about this. Like, you know, a lot of these teams that win in the NBA, man, they got Hall of Famers. Um, is there any – I'll say Tatum's a Hall of Famer. Who else do we have here that's at that level? You like Brown at that level? You like Green at that level? You like Smart at that level? Horford? No. No, I don't like any of those guys at that level, you know. I, I, but who would you want right now? I'll throw this question back to you. You're starting a team. You want Jalen Brown a, a, in his career, or you want Clay Thompson coming off injury? Who's a better player right now? Well, who? It, I think there's two different things, Timmy. I think starting a team, I'd probably take Jalen Brown to win this series. I, look, I like them both, but man, I. By game three, when you got to make shots and there's no sets and there's no surprises, I have a hard time passing on Clay Thompson, man. I think that dude, I, I start a team, he's younger, I'll go with Brown. But in this series, one series at this time, I, I'll take Clay Thompson. I will. You wouldn't. No, I, I, I think that Clay Thompson has, you know, wh where he's able to go share, turn back time. What a great video. By the way, has anyone seen Cher lately? She looks outstanding. I got to get her skin products. I thought she was wearing a wig in that video because the hair no. was just completely out of control. Um, but Clay no, Thompson. No, you need, you need her plastic surgeon. You need her plastic but, surgeon. You don't need her skin products. <laughs> you need that. You know, and, and give a shout out to Sonny Bono because he was not a handsome man in like the seventies and stuff. He had like the talk about the, the old school with the stash. I mean, he legit look, looked like he walked off the set of Boogie Nights and he, he got, he got Cher to be like, I'm going to marry you. It was pretty amazing stuff. That was just a different era back then. And like the looks were just different. Um, my point with Clay Thompson is turning back time is he has blips. It's like 16, 14, 17, 30, 12, 14, 15, 26. Like, he just has these blips in his game where it's not consistently. And I, you could just tell with the line because his player prop, Dan, was always around 20 to start off the playoffs. But he's gone under that number so many times that, you know, last out against Dallas, his player prop was 18 and a half. And, and now he blew past that in the first half. But the player, his number has come down nearly two points in the postseason because the lines have adjusted because he's gone under so much. I would take Jalen Brown. I just think he's more athletic. I think Clay's got like a couple couple of years left. Like the injuries have really devastated what he could do as far as putting the ball on the floor and, and literally getting by guys. But he's an amazing shooter. And when he plays great and he shoots the ball great, you know, Warriors are really hard to beat. All right. I want to talk about a betting strategy. You ready? Yeah. So the other day, the Warriors are playing – it was three to one. It was back in Golden State. 
I told my wife, I go, look, it's minus 300. I said, if I was in the damn stock market and somebody told me, hey, man, give me three grand within three hours, I'm going to give you four grand back. <laughs> we would do that, right? We, we, you know, I, Tim, I looked at that. I told my wife I bet 300 to get 100 back. At the end of the game, I said, no, I, I bet 3,000 to get, you know, another 1,000 back. To me, that's how you invest in gambling. That's investing. There was no way the Warriors were going to lose that game. Do you subscribe at all to the investment strategy that I just laid out? I, I, I do not because here's why. I like the bet and how I would bet it would I would try to parlay it with another game. And now parlays are for suckers, but the nice thing about it is you could just have a fixed amount that you could lose. Because if you bet it straight, and it ended up being a winner, you know, if you lose, you have to win three bets in order to be even. So the risk is the risk to me just outweighs the reward. So if you took a fixed amount, say, you know, a thousand dollars, and you were just like, all right, I'm just going to lose a thousand, but I'm going to parlay the Cubs and Warriors money line at home. Now you're getting some sort of value. I like betting money lines, especially in the NBA, because, you know, you're going to lay that game was like seven and a half, maybe seven. And at the end of the game, it did get kind of like dicey, like, whoa, are they going to cover and stuff, even though the game was never in doubt. I like betting NBA money lines, but how I like to bet it is I'll just throw it in a parlay, make the parlay a little bit juicier if I want to watch the game because nothing pisses me off more than when my team wins and they win comfortably and they win handily, but they don't cover like six and a half because Spencer Dinwiddie makes a three at the buzzer and then what happens is I start eating double stuffed Oreos and then the sugar hits me. Now I can't go to bed at night. Like it's a whole domino effect that pisses me off. So I've learned this throughout the years, Dan. That's why I that's why that's why I just bet at money line. I didn't even watch the game. I'm like, I ain't watch. And and next thing you know, it did get to eight, but it was a money line bet. I thought, you know what, this is getting sexy. Yeah, I don't care. They're going to win. I'm glad I'm up eight in the fourth quarter. Next thing you know, it's 20. I know what you're saying about that. I do. I know what you're saying about the parlay because you figure there's two two or three teams, whatever you want to do with the parlay, but you've got one in hand, right? You feel like, the, the you know, it, it, it. I understand the value, but I just looked at it as the stock market, brother. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I always – I had a buddy – that when we would go out, he was a foreigner. And, 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 and like, European guys are just different. Like, you play with them, right? Like, Uwe Blob and stuff. I play with this Croatian guy. He never stretched. He used to just rub hot water on his knees. And, like, that was enough for him to stretch. I always found that to be wildly unusual. But I had a, a guy from Europe that he would always talk about, like, getting the tongue loose when we would go out. He goes, you got to get the tongue loose. So I was like, all right, yeah, what does that mean? So he would go up and talk to someone that he found looks wise to be below his standards just so he could kind of get layup lines going and like work on his flow a little bit. So how I look at like a money line play minus 300, I look like that as like getting the tongue loose a little bit, like the Bloody Mary of betting. Like that's my winner. Let's try to get the other two home. What's wrong with you? <laughs> It's a simple question. Just like, tell me this. What did, like, what did Uwe, did Uwe Blob, did he do something weird that was just like, that? that's not warming up. War, rubbing hot water on your knees is not stretching. I know it's not. Trust me. Like, did he do anything <laughs> no. that, 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 that you were like, that was unusual? No, no. They, he did something very unusual that I don't want to talk about publicly, but okay. no, no, uh, no, <laughs> no, not, no, no, uh, no. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to go back to something <laughs> else. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, like Grant Williams in game seven, the number was five and a half. I'm like, hey. Grant Williams, this is going to be his game because they're going to try. He, he had seven points in the first. How much do you, how much do you like, particularly in a game like this? Let's take a star, right? Let's take, you know, Steph, 
What's the highest you would go for Steph Curry and take the over? What's the most? Yeah, I mean, point props with Steph Curry is quite the conundrum because when you bet under, I, you're asking for it. You know what I mean? Like, before I came on air, yes. I had a very interesting conversation with my wife. She goes, we have a lot to do. And then I had a suggestion of like something we need to do is actually hang pictures in our uh, guest room. And here's her response. She goes, that's actually the last thing on my list. Didn't make me feel great. Right? I was like, well, I said one suggestion. It's the last thing on your list. Like, it's just not a great feeling. It's not a great feeling when you bet under with Steph Curry. You basically sit there for two and a half hours. And you're like, this sucks. Like every shot he takes, everybody wants to go in and you're rooting for it to miss. I think it can become a little bit of a downward spiral. Like all of a sudden you're watching like the Johnny Depp, Amanda Heard trial every single day, every single hour. Like you start going down a rabbit hole. You watch old David Copperfields on YouTube. Like you start watching weird stuff when you root for Steph Curry under. So I don't know. I only like betting Steph Curry overs because it puts me in a good mood. It makes me happy. Like all of a sudden I wave to like my neighbor. It just puts me in because he's going to take a lot of threes. He's exciting to watch. Betting Steph Curry unders, Dan, puts me in a shitty mood, and I don't like being in a bad mood. But what would be the number? Like, he's 27 and a half. You've got a choice. You, obviously, you would either take the over or you wouldn't bet it. Correct. Yeah. I mean, Steph's fun. You know? Steph's like, yeah, Steph's going to take wild threes. You know what's amazing about Steph Curry is he played for Bob McKillop in college. Now, Bob McKillop was my next-door neighbor, Davidson head coach from 1981 until 1989. Bob McKillop, Davidson head coach, went right from coaching high school basketball directly to become a head coach at the Division I level. And he was basically Norman Dale in high school. You know, no shot clock, five passes every time, ran, ruled with like an iron fist. He actually had to recruit Bob McKillop, called him into his office. This guy was an Irish guy. His parents were first generation Irish. He ended up being a really good player, but he liked smoke cigarettes and he would like drink beers. Like he was that guy in high school, but he was really good. And he took all of his letters that he was getting from college and he put them in a trash bin, and he burned them in front of him. And he goes, this is your career going up in flames. Right? So Bob McKillop, like kind of ruled with an iron fist. And then he goes to Davis today, coaches Steph Curry and Steph Curry shoot like 36 foot threes. And he's like allowing this to happen. But why Bob McKillop has had success is because he evolved. He evolved as a coach. He realized the game was changing. You know, this series, when I look at it, is going to come down to one thing. Three-point shooting. You have teams that go eight for 45 or seven for 39. Hey, you ain't going to win. So the game now has become so much of three-point shooting for both of these teams. You could just look at who wins the three-point line. That's the team that's going to win each game. So would you bet over 27 and a half? Yes. 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 <laughs> what would be the high if it went to 32? Would you bet 32 and a half over? Yes. What would be the number I, I that you say, yeah, I'm not doing it? You know, the thing is, you know, and I do so many gambling shows, and I'm going to be hosting NBA Bet throughout the NBA finals on NBA TV. And this is going to be a question because people want to know Steph Curry over or under over. I don't know. Whatever the number is over. I don't know. Because like, <laughs> how could you possibly handicap under? Cause you know, like he has this ability to make all these shots. And then once he makes shots that opens up his driving game, like, you know, like you're betting against the greatest shooter in the history of basketball. I don't know. I don't, I don't ever think that's a good bet. Is this going to be a high-scoring series? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I was really surprised how Jimmy Butler just did whatever he wanted. You know, I, I thought Boston had guys that could match up with him. You know, whether it is Tatum or Brown or Marcus Smart. And, like, Jimmy Butler, you want to talk about Hall of Famer? What do you think of Jimmy Butler, Hall of Famer? First thought. No. First thought. No. Yeah. You? First thought, no, but getting really close. Like, um, right. 
you go look go look at his stats. He averaged two points a game as a rookie. He was the last guy on the Bulls bench. <laughs> And now he's got a Heat team to an NBA Finals, and he almost got him back to an NBA Finals. They're, he doesn't have a whole lot of help down there in Miami. You know, Kyle Lowry's like 104 years old. P.J. Tucker's 105 years old. Like, that was not a great starting five. He almost got the team to an NBA <laughs> championship, you know, final. So, I don't know. We're going to have to reevaluate that when it's all said and done. But, um, yeah, de- defense, I was surprised that Boston, you know, had kind of in and out of, the, of moments like that. You, you know, one thing about the Warriors is I would force them to make twos because once they start hitting threes, look out. I think the X factor for Golden State, and you nailed this because I saw an old tweet of yours. If there's one player on Golden State that could swing this series, I think it's Jordan Poole. How great has he been? Cool, man. Man. Tell you what, hey, Tim, he gets by everybody. Like, I don't care who's guarding him. I mean, I'm not saying he makes the right decision all the time or finishes all the time, but that dude gets by whoever he wants to get by. He's unbelievable. His number's 15 and a half going in. That's a lot. Yeah, you know, I, I think the way that Steve Kerr uses him as, you know, you remember he started early in the postseason. Steph was coming off the bench in, in the first series against Denver. You know, when he comes in, the the light is like beyond fluorescent green. Like that's the greenest light I have seen. And you're right. His his decision making at times, I'm like, yo, what is this guy doing? But man, Steve, that's where I give Steve Kerr credit. He's evolved where he's kind of let this guy grow out there on the floor, making bad decisions coupled with good decisions. But he's electrifying. And you know, if I was building a team. That would be a guy that I would try to go steal away from Golden State because I think he has all-star potential. And the fact that he played with Clay and Steph, to me as a general manager, would make him even more valuable because he got to watch two pros every single day in practice work, work on their game, understand their basketball IQ. Like the fact that he played under those guys, like that's opened his eyes so much. And now his talent is starting to shine. I think if he plays exceptionally well, which means 18 to 22 points a game, Warriors going to end up winning the series. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, you know, that dude is – he's been ridiculous. Uh, hey, let me, let me go back to the uh, Celtics for just a second and what you said about Jimmy Butler. You know, they do have the Celtics have the player of the year, the defensive player of the year in Marcus Smart, and he couldn't do nothing with Butler. Maybe – is he banged up? Who's healthier going into this series? Yeah, I, I think Boston has had some issues with that, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, safety and protocol. I think Harford missed the game. Smart's been banged up. Uh, if you had to pick who was more healthy, yeah, I think I think the Warriors are more healthy. I think there's something to be said about going through the wars like Boston has. What, what amazing storylines the Celtics have had in the playoffs. You know, when they played Brooklyn, hey, that was a series, even though they swept them, I believe the margin of victory in all four games combined was like under 20. So they, they figured out a way to win really close games. Tatum had that game winner. I thought the most impressive win of the entire postseason was when they went to Milwaukee in game six, Boston, and beat Giannis on his home floor. That to me was like, oh, wow, that was because they had lost at home. They had lost momentum. And like you think Giannis is going to be able to close them out. They win that game. And then they showed a lot of toughness in the game down in Miami. It wasn't pretty, but win game seven on the road, really hard to do. I, I, I just, they're, they, they've just shown me so much guts. Now, they may be out of gas. That I don't know. They may be really banged up, but they, they've shown me a lot in this postseason. What I've seen from the Warriors is those spurts and the way they could score in bunches, and they're really sexy. But if you're gambling, you pay a premium every time you bet Golden State. It's like betting the Cowboys. It's like betting the Yankees. Like you pay extra to bet them because they have such a strong track record of winning games and winning championships. Six finals in eight years. How about the decision of Steve Kerr? He almost became the New York Knicks head coach. He went like this. (laughs) Knicks, Warriors. Knicks, Warriors. Like, (laughs) <laughs> One of the great sports decisions, Dan, of all time. I'm going to tell you one of the worst sports decisions of all time. You ready? One of the worst sports decisions of all time. I was screaming about this. My man, Larry Bird, drafted 
Miles Plumley over Draymond Green. I'm going to say it again. Miles. Not even Mason Plumley. I was screaming. Were you uh, were you with the Big Ten Network when Draymond was in the league in the Big Ten? Yeah, are we gonna talk about how they fired me? I mean, I, I, you are some, I just told you that my wife no. told me the thing that I want to get done in my house. She said that's last on my list, and now you're bringing up old scars when I got fired at Big Ten Network. No. I, you know, I'm, no. I'm messing with you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes, I was there. Draymond Green, to me, I don't know how many games I did of his, but he was always, I mean, he was not Magic Johnson, but he always had that enthusiasm, right? He always, and then he would play at the end of games. I mean, I don't know. I'm not taking Miles Plumley ahead of Draymond Green. Pacers did. He's going to his eighth final or his sixth final in eight years. That's it. That's enough. When are you on TV today? What do you got? When are you on TV? Um, I, I did TV early this morning. And I was on CBS at 8.48 Eastern, 7.48 Central. And I would tell them a story that I was in Philadelphia at this wedding and I was waiting to get a coffee yesterday. And this guy came up to me and he goes, man, you look like a celebrity I know. So like, yeah, I puffed the shoulders out a little bit, like thinking like, you know, maybe I look like someone that was recently in Top Gun Maverick, right? Maybe I look like Jake from 16 Candles, like, Maybe I'm going to get a compliment early in the morning that's going to set my day up in a good way, right? And he goes, I know who you look like. You look just like Steven Seagal. And I went, yeah, that's actually not a compliment. That's somebody you don't want to look like anymore. He looks terrible, Steven Seagal. And that was what that was the compliment I got early in the morning in Philadelphia. And let's just say it didn't put me in a great mood. <laughs> Take him where you can get him. Just take, hey, as you get older, take a compliment wherever the hell you can get a compliment, pal. I mean, hey, it could be worse. Could it, you know, I don't know. I think you're a very handsome man, so I'd say Tom Cruise is dead as Steven Seagal. But, hey, what do I know? I look like this. This would be like, what the let, hell? let me give you a little, let me give you a little equivalent, right? This would be like you're out there you're with your beautiful wife, and someone comes up to you and says, you look like somebody famous. And you go, wow, I'm really excited. And then they say George the Animal Steel, like a famous 80s wrestler with the hairy chest. Like, <laughs> you don't want to be called that. Nobody wants that. Hey, I'd get offended. I'd say, have you seen my back? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, thanks for the time. Appreciate you, Timmy D. You're See awesome. See you guys. Bye, Dan. Thanks, my, thanks, my friend. Oh, I love that, man. What a conversation, man. That'll go anywhere with Timmy D. All right, today in stupidity. I got a lot of stupid to talk to you all about, including my good friends in a town I really like, Jasper, Indiana. And by the way, uh, we will be talking about the SEC spring meetings tomorrow uh, with Trey Wallace. Hey, we got two dudes, Saban and Jimbo, in the same room. We'll be right back.
Hey, Dan Dockett's back with you. Last half hour of the show, we do a segment that I really like, and we always, and I mean always, get a bunch because this segment is the segment that never disappoints. It is called Today in Stupidity. Now, let me set it up for you, all right? Um, Basically, if something happens that's really stupid, we discuss it. Make sense? I think it does. Uh, By the way, thanks to everybody for joining us today. The OutKick, uh, well, actually, our uh, YouTube chat is just absolutely on fire. A lot of folks are there. A lot of folks are having a conversation about whatever the heck it is that they want to have a conversation about. And we will go to our own YouTube channel January, or excuse me, January, June 6th. So in a week, we will be on our own YouTube channel, and it'll be great. All right. Today in stupidity, let me explain something to you. Giants manager Gabe Kapler is protesting basically the United States. Gabe Kapler, who has made millions playing baseball, a game with a stick, millions, uh, allegedly involved in steroids, allegedly when he was a manager at another location, kind of poo-pooed a sexual assault. I say allegedly because, look, these things have never been put in a court of law. But now Gabe Kapler is offended by the way and the direction that our country is going. So he is going to boycott the national anthem. I'm cool with that. You do whatever the hell you want. I don't give two rats ass about Gabe Kapler. I I don't. I know that some media members are finding strength in Gabe Kapler. I know that some of our media members are really excited about Gabe Kapler. I give a rat's ass about Gabe Kapler. You know what? I am all all for protests. I am. But I'm not all for protests because something is in this country that you don't like. I mean, if you don't like something, great, protests. But don't all of a sudden, because it's Memorial Day, say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, I'm not going to do it on Memorial Day. Out of respect to those that died. Out of respect to those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Well, see... I think every day we should honor our anthem, and I think every day we should honor those that died. I do. I do. I don't think we should just have one day, two days, three days, whatever you want. I don't. I think we should have every day. I think every day our actions should be moving towards a better country. And if Gabe Kapler feels that protesting, taking a knee makes it that, then good for him. But I don't respect it. I don't. Guys have lived such privileged lives like Gabe Kapler, and I know that this argument that I'm making right now can be torn apart. I understand that because I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth. I respect the fact that he's protesting, but I don't. for whatever the reason, I've never respected him. And I'm sure he's one of the greatest all-time men. I'm sure every media member will write a puff piece on him because he's doing what the liberal media wants you to do, which is stand up to the Second Amendment or whatever the hell he's standing up to. How about we stand up to common sense? Or we stand up for common sense. How about we say, all right, let's see what these gun laws or these things that have been passed and are waiting for the Senate, what do they truly have inside them? What is the pork? What is the stupidity? And if the senators that are paid to represent us feel that we as a constituency would support this bill, then sign the damn thing. Do whatever you want to do. I just don't respect. I don't know why. This is just me. I don't know why. I just don't respect Gabe Kapler. I remember when he came up as this big prospect. I remember reading an article. I lived by Detroit. He came up in Detroit. Then I watched him. I always thought he was one of those pretty boy fraud kind of guys. And that's what I see here. So that's my issue. All right, today in stupidity, an Arkansas baseball announcer. I got to tell you, I announce games. But an Arkansas baseball announcer called a player for the Razorbacks a disgrace. A loser. Now, this is an announcer. This is an announcer that, frankly, couldn't play dead. See, what happened here, what what had happened was the announcer heard that this player who had transferred in from Kent State had made, according to the announcer, again, according to the announcer, this player had made statements insulting the beloved Hog fans, right? This kid had said something like, look, we got fans here. They're crazy. And when you lose, 
You know what? Tough times. Michael Turner is the catcher's name. So the guy said, hey, wait a second. You are a disgrace. Called him a stupid ass and a loser. And there he can't wait until this guy leaves the program, Michael Turner. Under the guise, and this is where announcers are idiots, under the guise of, well, I'm protecting the fan base. This guy's only been here one year, and I must protect the fan base. This guy's name is Derek Russian. And so he's with ESPN Arkansas, or whatever the hell it is, and he decides, I'm the great defender of the calling of the hogs. And Michael Turner, you've only been here one year. You can't even kind of criticize our fans. I don't think what Michael Turner said was anything other than, look, it's crazy around here. You don't want to go on social media when we lose. And truthfully, that's a great thing for college baseball. I'm not saying it's a great thing for players, but it's a great thing that we're starting to get enough fan bases that care so heartily for college baseball. It's fantastic. So this is the first time, listen to this. So this is the first time since 2015 Arkansas uh, has not been a host of a regional. In baseball, if you're really good and you're a high seed, you host a region. You get on to the College World Series a little easier that way. There's a reward. So, all right. So this clown, Derek Rushkin, Russian, decides that this player, this catcher, who played 53 games for him, came over from Kent State. He's been a pretty good player. They lost both games. Okay, they finished 38 and 18. This guy, Russian, says, oh, you're a loser. You're a disgrace. Can't wait till he is out of the program. And, of course, calls him a stupid ass. I'll say it, and I wouldn't say this about a young player. Michael Turner, he's a fifth-year guy from Kent State. He's a stupid ass, the catcher for the Razorbacks. All Turner said was we're trying to keep the circle tight, cut out the outside noise. It's not always that easy to play here. There are lots of people that are fans. Some are good fans. Some are not good fans. If you read Twitter after the game, you can get, you can get it, it can get in your mind a little bit. So you're just trying to keep the circle tight and move forward. What the hell's wrong with that? I mean, I don't know. First of all, Rushkin says, you're not a Razorback. You're a rental player and have sucked. So thanks for nothing. Secondly, as a rental player, you do not get to come in here and criticize this fan base, you stupid ass. Not a chance. The question was about the entire team, and you use the entire answer to take a swing at this fan base. You're a disgrace, Michael Turner, this idiot says. You're a disgrace. You should not get to wear that uniform again. What a loser. You know why they're losing? Because you're a loser and you're the catcher. You're in charge of this whole thing on the infield. You're a loser and a disgrace, and you can't get out of this program soon enough. Wow. I mean, look, anybody that doesn't think that Twitter does suck, out of your mind. Of course it does. And some guy that can't play dead, all of a sudden getting to say, hey, look, calling a kid a loser is nuts. Uh, Man, I don't even know what to say about this next one. The old pitch. Do we have video of this? The pitch got stormed in France after a soccer game. Look at this. Injuries, arrests, fires. Now, I got to tell you, I'm not proud of this, but I've always wanted to go to a soccer game match, whatever the hell you call it, on the pitch where you could get shot. I always did. I've told my wife, I want to go to a soccer match game whatever, where you could get stabbed, shot, shanked, blown up, whatever. This is in saint Etienne. This is in France. Uh, Los Verdes exit Liga 1 on penalties. Now, this is the second time this has happened over in France. So, listen, for the second time in as many days, 
Sunday witnessed shocking scenes at a soccer game in France as A.S. saint Intididu was relegated from Liga 1 on penalties, which enabled A.J. Uru to return to the top flight via the playoffs. They had chaos on Saturday. Home supporters stormed the pitch at Stade Joffrey, Jinan, moments after Levitz. Sunday, regulation, re-leg rate, whatever the hell it is. It means they're being sent down. That's what we should do here with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Listen to this. 33 people suffered injuries, 14 police, seven, uh, 17 spectators, and two Aru players are being injured. And it is chaos. Never happened. And it's happening more and more. But I got to tell you, I don't want to go to a Raiders home game and get the hell beat out of me in football. I don't know why. But football fighting or basketball or going to baseball and having hooliganism doesn't interest me. There's something about going to a soccer match on the pitch where I could get killed that I ain't mad about. That's insane, right? You don't want to go to something like that. I've had NBA guys tell me, you got to go to a Red Belgrade basketball game. And I've talked about that. I have. I've talked about that. But I've always been fascinated. I had a guy and a gal at a bar in wherever VCU is, Richmond, Virginia. I was getting ready to call a game. I was sitting there. I went and worked out. I like to go sit in my own filth after I work out in a hotel. So, like, we had the evening off. I, I was done whatever. It was like 4 o'clock. I went and worked out. I'm sweating like a pig. I go sit at the bar. I always order a Diet Coke, quesadilla, and whatever they have on draft that I like. It's what I do. And I sit in my own filth. And it's one of the most relaxing. And I bring my iPad. I bring my iPad because, frankly, I just like sitting there. No one bother me. So I'm in this bar. I'm sitting there at the hotel. And... The guy who's the manager, he's talking to me. He's from Tel Aviv. And then the gal who's the bartender, she's from Tel Aviv. He hired her. I, I don't know if they were married. I think they might have been. But anyway, we're talking. I go, look, should tell me soccer. I want to go to a soccer match. I want to go to a soccer match where, quite frankly, I can be killed. They told me you got to go to Tel Aviv. I said, all right, I'm going to try to get to Tel Aviv. Or you got to go to Hungary. Now, this is about eight years ago, so it's been a while. Maybe they changed all the rules, but right now, all you got to do is go to France. Hell, you can go to Paris, have a great time at the Eiffel Tower, and then go try to get not killed. I don't like it, but I do like it in soccer, and I got a full confession. I don't know why. I wish I knew why, but I don't. I, I don't. If some of you can tell me why, then I would love to hear why. I may run to the YouTube chat to see why, but I got to tell you. Different. I don't want to go to a basketball game and some idiot runs on the court. I don't want that. Who the hell wants that? I want to go to a baseball game and some big, fat, stupid White Sox fan wants to throw hands with me. I don't want to do that. I, I don't. I, I don't want to do that at all. So, you know, uh, no. But I do want to go to a soccer match where that could happen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know about you. Hey, Dan, sitting in one's own filth is magical. It is. It is. I literally, I love doing this. We got a little club over here. I go work out. They got a bar. So I go to work out, and I usually go pretty hard. You know what I mean? Like, I usually go pretty hard. Like, I'm not afraid. I'll go hard for me. I mean, I'm a 60-year-old guy that's fat. But anyway, so I go. I like to go hard. And then I get a towel, put it around my neck, go sit in the bar, quesadilla, Diet Coke, beer. And the beer choice right now is mango cart. Just saying. All right. I, I don't know, man. I, 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 I thought I knew the world that we live in. I did. I thought I knew the world. But I also, I really, truly, truly thought I knew the state of Indiana. I thought I knew Jasper, Indiana. I did. I'll tell you, I love Jasper, Indiana. The head coach at Ball State, Mike Lewis, I went down there and recruited Jasper, Indiana. I loved it. Jasper, Indiana, big old German Catholic town, bars everywhere. They got great food in Jasper, Indiana. 
Fantastic beer. Fact, I may take my wife there. In Jasper, Indiana, this is becoming a thing, and I don't get it. I don't care what you do. You want to raise money in your hometown? Go raise money in your hometown. In Jasper, Indiana, a pride event with a drag queen performance is being advertised for all ages, and they are encouraging kids to bring cash to tip the drag queens. Now, I got to tell you, I'm no prude, but this doesn't make any sense to me. So we're trying to teach kids how to tip strippers. These aren't strippers, I get that, but that's what you're doing. Here is the ad. Do Boys County Pride. Don't miss a chance to come out and see Du Bois County, first ever family-friendly drag show at D.C. Pride in the Park, Du Bois County. These professional entertainers cannot wait to put on a pride-filled show for you all. Tips are not required, but are greatly appreciated. Drag is not cheap. So make sure to bring the event. The event is open to all ages. Man. All right. June 24th, 9 to 10.30 p.m., Jasper, Indiana. That's great. All right. That's great. That's what we do, huh? That's what we're teaching our kids. That'd be like my dad trying to teach me, hey, look, Dan, here's how you tip a stripper. Now, you're going to say it's not the same, but it is. It is. You want to go to a drag show? Go to a drag show. You want to do that? Do that. I don't care. But Jasper, Indiana, what the hell are you doing? Like, this is becoming a thing. Like, look, you know, I guess if you do something enough, then it becomes normalized, right? So grade schools are having drag shows. What are you going to do? I don't get it. I know I'm old. I know you young guys get it. Some, so one of you young guys, tell me. Tell me, tell me why we would want our children tipping drag queens on a nice Sunday, uh, nice Saturday evening. Please tell me that. Well, you know, they got to learn there's diversity. You're right. You do. Yeah, you're right. Okay. All right. People are nuts, man. Uh, You know what? Again, I'm not real life because I'm 60 years old. Ain't nobody supposed to pay attention to me. But I just throw it out there for y'all to decide. And I got to tell you, I, you know, going to a drag show with my little kid so he can learn to tip somebody is asinine. Just to me. Uh, I give you bad bets every day at this time. All right. But I'm going to today, just for the Sam and Henry of it, I'm going to give you a good bet. Are you ready? Get your pen and paper ready. But I am checking one thing out before I give you this bet. Uh, The one thing to check out is this. Tonight, it's the Avalanche taking on the Oilers. This is an interesting number. Like, if you followed Edmonton, man, they just score goals, right? I'm taking the Avs tonight. Now, there's a lot of juice on it, okay? I'm going to take the Avs minus one and a half. I would move that down to minus one goal if I could. But on my app here, they don't have it. But I'm going to take the abs tonight. See, here's the deal with Edmonton. This could be 7-4. I could see this being 5-2 tonight. You're at home. Now, last night, the Rangers beat the living hell out of Carolina. They beat them 5-1. I think this, I I will take even the 1.5. I want to move it to 1. I would love to move it to 1. But I'm having a hard time moving it to 1. Abs minus 1, I'll bet the farm on tonight. Because the worst I'm going to do is catch a tie. That's the worst. But I'm just telling you, tonight, take the Avs over Edmonton. And if you got to give one and a half, give the one and a half. Van Pasterman asks, why is it okay to have kids at at drag shows and not have regular strippers? I don't know. A lot of real people ask questions like that. I get it. We're all supposed to cater to the .0002%. But a lot of real people like Van Pastor, man, ask real questions. And that's a real question. 
Look, it ain't going to affect me. If I had grandkids, I wouldn't take them. You want to take them? Take them. But man, we get this crap thrown in our face all the time. Drag show at school. If I if my kids went to a drag show that was mandatory at school to learn how to tip and all that, I'd be a little pissed. I'd be a little pissed. Uh, Sean Black needed to learn something about gambling. Jason Tatum not getting 30 points cost me a parlay. Never mind. You always bet over on players. If you bet under, it's miserable. It is miserable. I mean, if... Uh, Hey, Dan, if I bet against all your recommendations, will I make money? No. You'd have lost three grand the other day. Instead, if you'd have taken mine, you'd have won a grand. No. No. Hey, uh, Dockage, why are you fades lousy? I don't know why you fades lousy, but they are. There's no, look, here's the deal in gambling. Let me finish the show with this. There are only certain times that I should gamble. And it's when I absolutely know. Like, I absolutely knew that there was no way the Warriors were going to lose to the frickin' Dallas Mavericks the other day. Everything else is just gambling. Like, you could take Minnesota over Detroit this afternoon, 110 start, and you got action. If you're just looking for action, if you're looking for investments, you don't take that game because baseball's damn near impossible. Baseball's stupid. Bad hop. You know what I mean? I mean, I love baseball, but betting baseball is just stupid. So be careful out there, people. And tell your friends about our show. We had a lot of good numbers today. We had a lot of people on the YouTube chat. All this is going to be in one hour, downtown Indy. I will be at 1075thefan.com or wherever you get Spotify and all that stuff. You can listen from noon to three. I'll be there talking about the Indy 500, the playoffs, the Colts, whatever the hell else we feel like talking about. And the YouTube chat will be bumping per normal. Ryan and Corey and Dylan and everybody else, thanks. Timmy Doyle was great. If you missed that part, go back. It'll be all over my Twitter feed because I am uber competitive. I'm trying to get 50,000 views on Twitter every single day. So if you don't mind helping me, Sean Black and others, just retweet all of our stuff. Yeah, I'm begging. That's right, because I had fun on this job. I just heard Lee upstairs. That's a real woman. She's already ran five miles. She's already cleaned the house. She's up there making breakfast. She's talking to my daughter. That's a real woman, not some statue with a penis and a set of double Ds. Tomorrow, SEC, baby. Spring meetings. Saban. Jimbo. Yeah, we'll talk to Trey Wallace about those. I can't wait. Have a great, great afternoon, Doc. It's out.